<laughs> Actually, I'm sure I'll have some. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll hit send you some stages, you. Matt. Yeah. Uh, stage hey, one. Yeah, ben. I'll, I'll send you stages. Stage one is going to be called Bill Drill. Perfect. Okay. Stage two, okay. double Bill Drill. Okay. <laughs> stage three, a... head box at 25 yards. Stage Virginia four, count. Up, or yeah, Virginia count, hop. of course. <laughs> stage five, bunny stacks. Yeah, you know, I don't want to send you a bunch of fucked up drills for stages. Anyway, welcome to Practical Shooting After Dark. We're here to talk about shooting. All right, you guys all know the deal. Everybody comes here with a topic, something to talk about, which didn't exactly happen tonight, but, you know. We got we're doing, it. We're doing our best. We're getting it figured out. On deck tonight, we have Professor Kim. Hello. The future Area 3 director, I suspect, Mr. Matt Hopkins. Yes, hi. Yes, hi. <laughs> Your next Area 3 director. <laughs> Probably we're gonna. I need you to ramp up the carnival shit at the area uh, at the next. Oh, year. you guys have not seen anything yet. Good right, hula good. hoops, merry go rounds, jungle gyms. What else? That's just stage one, Joel. What I don't want. On two? I the I what I want you to do, Matt. <laughs> I'm sorry, Joel is also here, but Matt, oh, what yeah, I hi. want you to do is build a stage that's nothing but Polish plate racks, except yeah, for like the easy. one. One paper target. One paper target, a bunch of Polish plate racks. I was thinking... What like, about a mini popper at 75 yards and then Polish plate <laughs> racks through the rest of it? Perfect. All right, guys. I want to get going today first because I want to do a post-mortem on the recent USPSA rule changes uh, because I think it'd be funny. And, uh, you know, that, that that's actually the only reason. I think it'd be funny to talk about this. and it, It's useful in some ways. But mostly, I think it's funny. In the wake of all the f the feedback on the rule changes, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Of, that's a nice way of putting it, right? Feedback. There was a lot of feedback. yeah. I mean, it uh, is feedback essentially. Yes, it was a lot of feedback. It should be interesting to uh, assess what happened. So, I think it's fair to say USPSA put out some rule changes that I had, nobody really was asking for, nobody really wanted, but you know, they do what they do. Put out some changes. Uh, you're going to have magnets, do whatever the fuck you want on your belt, whatever, whatever. I think the funniest rule change, obviously, was the flashlight thing. That's what there's been the most mockery about. Um, so <laughs> I loved this. <laughs> the, the, the Hey, you can use flashlights. Um, and then the rules are a little bit unclear. Like, hey, the flashlight, it says the flashlight must function, um, <laughs> which is a little bit. I mean, the way I read that when they say the flashlight must function is that they don't want you to have a frame weight. You know, they don't want you to hog out the flashlight Vogel style, fill it up with lead, and use it as a frame weight. However, in a USPSA context, the reason you put a flashlight on your gun is to use it, wait for it, is to use it as a frame weight. So if these rules sound demented to you, it just means that you're paying attention. So we read the rules, we look at this like, huh, <laughs> we, I don't know if you guys were mad, I was laughing when I read the rule changes, because uh, the one thing I know about any rule changes coming from USPSA is they're not designed to make the matches better at all. That's not the point of it. It's designed to, whatever, serve their interests, make more money, whatever the fuck they're trying to do. Uh, but anyway, I see this, I'm like, okay, there's gonna be some questions about this. Now, we can read the rules and know what we think about them or what a normal, you know, an educated person might think or a native English speaker maybe might say about these rules, but I can't predict what Troy's going to say. None of us can. I think we've learned over the years that there's absolutely no way to predict what, re like how DNROI will interpret rules, even if he's the one writing them. I'm like, who the fuck knows? So naturally, uh, there's a lot of questions about this. And within a week, was the, it was a week of the rule changes coming out. They have to release a clarification, which is just so you know, that's how anybody listening to this, that's how you know that they know that they fucked up, right? If you're writing the rules and they're not clear enough and you have to like issue a clarification a week later, you did a shitty job the first time. And I'm not saying that to be mean to anyone. We all make mistakes, but if I were on the board, I'd look at this and be like, yeah, we made a mistake here, guys. There was a problem. Uh, so, of course, the uh, the uh, USPSA people, they released a clarification. Tr the attitude from Troy there was basically, that if you don't understand the rules, you're stupid. You know, that's that was kind of how I took that. Um, that was the tone of it, anyway. Like, just quoting the dictionary. Thank you, Troy. Very helpful. Um, 
And the USPSA people we saw, like the a couple of board members, uh, anybody I saw posting about it on social media, they were downright confrontational about it. Uh, and I think what was funny about this whole situation, what really has me in stitches, is the board, the USPSA establishment, all these people, they didn't think about what they did. They didn't examine the process. They gave them the rule changes. Um, they didn't, you know, think like, hey, we're driving these events. Like, hey, we did this rule change. We got a lot of, air quotes, feedback on it. And now we have clarifications. And it, it, they didn't take that on board. It was, it was the attitude, I, I think this is fair to say, was that all of us were either ignorant somehow. What One area director posted that we just didn't get it. We don't get it. He didn't explain it, of course. He didn't bother explaining it. Just linked to a video of some other guy, whatever. The, you know, oh, I mean, yeah. they they had to cherry pick the few people that did like the rule changes. They had, you know, they have to point to that and say, like, this guy gets it. <laughs> like, oh, I guess we just don't get it. We're too stupid to understand. Um, anyway, uh, that was that was what they did. So what I love about this is that these guys do this to themselves and then blame us for it. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, and it's, it's pretty, it's become pretty obvious right now that USPSA is, it's just a grift for the people running it. That's what it's about. Uh, and it, it's a little bit unfortunate, but, uh, it is funny to watch them operate. All right. So that's, is that a fair postmortem analysis guys? Or did I leave something out? No, I mean, sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> I bet they can't wait to get you on the board, Matt. I bet they can't either. <laughs> You're like, yes, that sounds like an accurate assessment. <laughs> <laughs> Ben's over here saying that USPSA is a grift and it's run by midwits. And, uh, you know, they spend their time shitting on the core people in the sport and not approving the matches. And Matt's like, yeah, that sounds about right. I bet they, they can't wait for you. Looking forward to January 1st. <laughs> <laughs> they might right. get rid of the board by then who knows well that's i mean let's hope so then they can <laughs> make it, e it way easier right yeah then they can really start improving the matches you know <laughs> <laughs> make it make it things better all right well that's all i had to say i mean i'm sure you guys don't want to say too much because you know you I guys are joel's opinion on this um uh, what good. flashlight think... have you found that's the best i think <laughs> Yeah, I think Ben pretty much uh, summarized it well enough, so uh, I don't have anything to add at this time. I mean, how I, I don't even mean I'm not even being cynical or joking. I'm being uh, when I say like I know when a rule change comes out that it's it's not designed to improve the matches at all. I'm not kidding. That's true. That's the way it's been for a while. Like they haven't. What have they given us? Like as far as like the 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 hardcore, like the competitors, the the guys that are match directors of their clubs, the people that are really serious about this, the group so of a few I, thousand people. What have they given us in, in the last? So time? I I think probably the biggest thing was making carry optics one forty millimeter mags or one forty millimeter. Yeah, I know, but what have they get? What have they done to improve the matches? I understand they've tinkered with the division rules. I'll wait. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. No, there, there is nothing. The only thing they've done is marginally improve the classification system. That's the only thing we've gotten, like as far as the series, guys. But anyway, enough about that. Um, Mr. Kim, you have mm -hmm. some fun to talk about. So well, you, and, yes. you and Hopkins, you guys have a new optic that you're... We have a co-topic. Co-topic here. Yes. Co-topic. Okay. So, so this topic... Uh, Kind of started actually yesterday, or actually uh, three days ago, or something like that. I was training, uh, getting ready for Area Six, and finally my SRO started having some issues on my practice gun. Uh, if I guesstimate, I probably shot 120,000 rounds through this practice gun because I started just match gun, match ammo only, and zero at practice. I don't practice with them. So I dedicated this one single gun with one single optic, SRO. Uh, so I've been shooting a lot. Uh, ever since it came out, uh, which is June of 2019, I think. Uh, and until now, I mean, nearly two years, I've been beating it up and 120,000 rounds minimum runs through it. So that, and, and dry fire. 
Uh, the issue I had, of course, I had the double dot issue, uh, glare issue in the sun. Any SRO has that issue, the lens issue. However, it didn't have any mechanical issue or the functional issue at all. Then uh, this was my first time having it last weekend, shooting it. Uh, it kind of jumped around the brightness and then it doesn't go to the middle section brightness anymore. So if there's a eight brightness setting, like the number seven wouldn't work and number it's just jumping from number six brightness to eight. So it's like a uh, moderate size dot to if I jump it up, it's just going to glare. So that setting one setting is missing out right now. Uh, it's just jumping a little bit, but it, still I can shoot it. No problem. I, I can either shoot it really, uh, really big size or big brightness or somewhat less brightness. Living in Washington, I can still shoot it with the number six brightness. No problem. Uh, so I wanted to talk about my optic handgun carry optics uh, optics so far. Uh, all my experiences, I've had Delta Point Pro uh, 2.5 MOA, uh, and of course SRO 2.5 and 5 MOA, and I had Romeo 3 Max and also the the Venom Vortex Venom, which um, I didn't really <laughs> go into that one at all because that was already having issues uh, on the market. People are talking about. So, so far I had, I can say I had zero pistol optic, slide mounted optic that worked flawlessly. None of them so far. Uh, so Romeo 3 Max has really nice lens, which I really love. There's no glare issue, no double dot issue, but however, the button starts failing, the brightness starts failing. And of course you, you can talk to other people shooting open as well. The specific optic has issues with the open. Uh, Delta Boy Pro uh, was exclusive to slight mounted setup. I, I heard a lot of open shooters having really good success at Delta Point Pro not breaking. However, slight going back and forth was having a problem. Uh, SRO was the one lasting the longest. However, if it gets dirty and you shoot, shoot under the sun facing the sun, the glare and the double dot issue just out of the bar park. I, I like don't want to shoot that under the sun unless I clean it all the time, of course. So my match gun had less problem shooting under the sun. Uh, it was a smaller identifiable second dot, which is a fake dot. So I can kind of identify that's the fake one. That's the real one. However, if you don't clean it, um, things like that happens or dirt in the front of the lens, you, you can't tell, hey, which one is my dot? So that was really frustrating at times. Uh, so here's my question to Hopkins. So the other point pro, I have the newer version of 2.5 MOA, which yeah. is new contact circuit. So it's lasting longer. I didn't go through testing on it, but I heard people saying, hey, I shot 10,000, I shot 20,000, still working. So, so far it sounds good with the new circuit on Delta Point. However, I still don't like how 2.5 MOA uh, if I'm shooting facing the sun, it doesn't get as bright as SRO or Romeo 3. So, and 6 MOA just came out. Yeah. The circle one, so, not the yeah, triangle. I, went, mm -hmm. I transitioned to 6 MOA Delta Point Pros. Mm -hmm. uh, they all have the new circuit board, which is, I found out what is the same as the old circuit board. Okay. So, they That's originally good. came out with... That's improvement. Does someone know if they have a new or old circuit board? Like, if I'm going to the store and yeah, I buy one, would tell, I know? You can tell pretty mm -hmm. easily... It looks like if you open the battery tray, take the battery out, there's like little, looks like fingernail polish, like clear fingernail polish on the contacts in the four points, when before it was just a piece of tape on the center and there was no fingernail polish. Oh, okay. And the so new circuit super, is x shape. Yeah. Uh, my super old, like from 2017, Delta Point Pro had the same exact setup. And I've got like 10,000 rounds on that. Okay. on a slide ride shadow too so i'm pretty confident we did some testing recently where we shot twenty thousand rounds through that same contact setup mm -hmm. and still worked after it no problem okay yeah uh so i like the six i could turn it down really low and still get a perfect perfect circle and then if i like turn it on full blast and it's still it doesn't flare out like everything else. Like a two point five will turn into like a starburst, yep. and look like a bigger dot. The the six MOA Delta Point Pro, I have found does not do that. Okay. Uh, 
So talk to me like I only know what a 2.5 SRO is because Wanchik told me to buy that, so I just bought two of them. Mm -hmm. How much does a 6 MOA dot cover up of a target? So if I want to shoot a head box at 20 yards, does a head box disappear? No, or not at no? all. It The dot okay. doesn't even cover up like top to bottom of the A zone in the head. Okay. And and then it's just like the same width as the height on it because it's a circle. Mm -hmm. So that dot will sit within the A zone in that headshot at 20 yards. Okay. Another thing I looked at was, you know, a mini popper has a little top of it, the head looking thing. Mm -hmm. If you put the dot in the top of that head, you can still see popper around it. If that makes sense. So that's yep. like a four inch, I think, head on it, left to right. And you can see popper around the dot. So, so I think I don't think the dot size is an issue at all. Like I don't like I don't foresee that being an issue on anything except for maybe Ipsic targets where they put like two inches of the A zone on it. And if yeah. they put that out very far, that's the only thing I could see where it would be an issue. But in my experience, they haven't put that out past ten yards or anything like that. Not not unless you're shooting one of Shannon's matches. I mean, that's a little crazy at that point though. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying it's a chance to match. <laughs> so do you like the six better than like the two and a half? Or does the dot size not even matter? And you just like the optic and the lens and the so clarity I of the dot? So I, I switched over from Sightmark. Uh, the window size is probably double the, the size of the Sightmark compared to the Delta Point Pro. And I love that. Like, I was okay. I was getting really good with the sight mark, but like as soon as I picked up the Delta Point Pro and started practicing with it, like totally like game changer. Like I've I've been practicing like moving on skunk targets also. Like the mm -hmm. dot size is still good for those, even at some distance. So I'm not super concerned about that either. Nice. I'm 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 really happy with it right now. I'm gonna shoot them all year. Mm -hmm. uh they have the lifetime warranty like pretty much everybody else now so if one does go down or anything like that i'll get it switched out that sounds awesome yeah yeah you have to get one kim we'll, we'll see i'll sell some tesla stock and get some. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh mr joel what uh, do you want to talk okay. about I want to talk about something I did this week. I guess not in shooting and maybe uh, match management. I don't know. Well, uh, so we're hosting the Cornhusker Classic, which is sponsored by the Pro Shop at my club. Uh, and this week we had a, well, actually yesterday, a committee meeting to pick stages for the match we're going to use. Uh, you know, we get a lot of questions here or on training group, like what makes a good stage? What's what makes, you know, why do you want to set up this versus the other? Whatever. Um I think the normal, like the normal thing we talk about is options make for a good stage. And some people, I think, get that a little bit confused. So options doesn't mean that you could just do something a couple different ways. But really, only one of them makes sense. So, for example, like, yeah, you could shoot this three different ways, but you'd have to be an idiot to pick two of the choices, for instance. Yeah, so that means there's that you can't there's really three ways. There's one way. Yes. No a lot option. of people don't understand this fundamental fact. Yes. So uh, kind of a rule I use when I'm creating stages is I don't even know what the stage plan is. Like for stages I'm designing myself, I, you know, I build the stage, there's targets all over the place, whatever. I literally don't know how the way to shoot this stage is when I'm setting it up, like when I'm setting it up on the ground or when I'm, you know, doing the diagram or whatever to like present to the committee. So it's like when he gets on the ground, there'll be a bunch of different ways. You and your homeboys look at it and you'll have to decide which way is the best because there's probably more than one way. Um, so the other thing I think that's really important is shooting targets from anywhere they're visible. Uh, I guess to talk a little bit crazy, I've been to some matches where there's like a line on the ground or some stick or some garbage. Like, well, if you shoot these targets from past this stick, you're going home. Like, I don't do that. So, so, area, it, so area three. <laughs> so if you like at a match at our club, if you see a target, you can shoot it. Obviously, if you're like, you know, looking way back behind you, you can see the back of some target or something. It would be ridiculous. But anything reasonably like in front of you that you see targets, if you see them, you can shoot them. And that's like, that's a rule as far as I'm concerned, just for a safety issue. You don't have to go into like, you know, magic rules, whatever. It's like, hey, see the targets, you shoot them. Um, and then the other thing that was been really good for our club is having lots of people designing stages. And that assures variety. 
So, I mean, we all, all four of us, if we decide we design stages, we all might come up with little different things that we think is fun or that make a stage interesting. So by having a variety of people submit stages, some people like short, medium, you know, long courses, whatever, you end up with a variety, a bunch of different styles. And uh, it's a really good thing. Hey, Joel, yeah. I actually, I think this should, you should emphasize that point. I don't think one person can do as good of a job designing stages possibly as multiple people. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're like designing different stuff and kind of mixing in ideas, I, I think that's really smart. Very much so. And then, so when we did this as a committee, we just have like a third of Google Drive and we're all kind of looking at them as a group. And then a couple of the last, <laughs> well, I'll final to say, one of the last stages was an area three stage that they decided to reuse. And they look at it and there's like three shooting boxes and you just look at this, you're gonna go to shooting box one, you're gonna shoot this clump of targets. You go to shooting box two, you're gonna shoot this clump of targets. Shooting box three, and there's a clump of targets there. There's really no other way to design this or to even, like you look at, there's no options. And then by the time we looked at all the other stages, somebody looked at that and they're like, oh, that looks dumb. There's only one way to shoot that. I'm like, yes, exactly. Like you understand what we're trying to accomplish. <laughs> nice. So like that was really good. But being like totally frank, before we looked at other stages and showed people what else, you know, and talked about what we were looking for when we designing stages, that might not have been apparent to people. So by them seeing a bunch of different stages and talking about them, what we're trying to accomplish, um, you know, sounds so cheesy, you kind of educate people and then they, you know, they're woke and they uh, they know what they're looking for. And then in the future that'll grow and they'll create interesting stages. And, uh, you know, it's a good thing. I got a question, Joel. Yeah. So did you guys or did the group go into the stage picking process with like a checklist of like, oh, I want to have some hoser targets. I want to have some long range targets. I want to have some single hand shooting or anything like that. Or did you just go in open? We didn't. Okay. Um, and I actually, I don't hate that idea either. Cause we kind of, when the stages all got designed, they basically all had what we call, if we call them like the USPSA style with the heads on the targets. And yeah. so it was like, yeah, we just submitted them all like that. Half of them will be, you know, IPSC style targets. So we'll just kind of divide that up. But no, we did really didn't set a, a, a like a checklist. Like Matt, you have unloaded start. Wanchik, you have one-handed shooting. You know, Ben, you have activators, whatever. We kind of just let everybody design their own thing. And, you know, it is what it is. Have you looked at it after the fact of choosing and seeing that everything's incorporated in that? That we did. Because okay, you, cool. you do want a balanced test of skills. Yep. And then we're like, hey, this would be a really good one-handed stage. We should have one-handed shooting in the match. Oh, this this will have a very high hit factor, very close stage. One of them, uh, one of the stages I designed is called uh, "I Had a Bad Experience." So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, you know, it's like that's that's a very a very careful shooting stage. It's going to reward reward like reactive shooting and you know shooting very carefully. So, yeah, I I think having a match with uh, you know all the different skills tested is important. And again, by kind of soliciting, asking everybody to throw their their designs in, you kind of assure that variety on somewhat level because somebody will have, you know, everybody has different ideas for what makes the stage interesting. I like this topic because I'm going to be doing this for a free state coming up here soon. So. Excellent. I'd love to submit some stages for you. Yeah. Would you please? Yes. Just take the Area 3 matchbook and send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> One's got a moat and a drawbridge, and there's alligators in the in the moat. We already figured out the first stage. No, it'll have a moat and a drawbridge and alligators, but it'll be three boxes. And yeah. you go to them. <laughs> and there's no procedurals. You just get eight by the alligator if you fall in the in the moat. Man. That's a self-correcting issue. <laughs> All right, you goons. Let's move on to a question. All right. Uh I've been a USPSA member since May of 2020. I'm very accurate, too accurate. What are some things very accurate shooters can do in dry fire to speed up while maintaining mostly Alpha Charlie shooting given the fact that dry fire doesn't have recoil? I'm shooting a Glock 35 with factory ammo. I'm not sure if that's your main. All right, so how do you learn to, for the accurate guys, how do you learn to speed up your shooting in dry fire? Come on, guys. Confirmation drill. Please? Oh, that, that's good. That's Leslie. I, Mr. Kim, I'm so glad you said that. So, yes. uh, yeah, so you have to go do a live fire drill to try different aiming schemes. And then the point of dry fire is you learn to apply it, you know? So 
whatever level of confirmation is appropriate for the target, you actually have to really rigidly enforce that in dry fire. Like force yourself to apply the aiming scheme. Right? Yes. Absolutely. I also like par times as in pass or fail. So like accelerator sub six, if it's 6.1 seconds, it's a fail. I don't care if they're all alphas. And I doing that also like forces you to, you know, make the time happen. Yeah, I think this is, this is, it's actually really, I think, I mean, I, I was the same way. So I, I find it tough to, to speed up and dry fire because when you're shooting live fire, I mean, if you're a really accurate guy, an accurate but slow guy, and then you start shooting live ammo, you always feel like the sights are moving around a lot more than they actually are. Mm -hmm. So it's, this is a difficult problem to solve without recoil, I think. Solvable, but difficult. What do you think? Matt, do you have anything to throw? So, the only thing I can think of is pushing the part times down. So like if he's doing an array like in three seconds, like go down to 2.9 and do it again. Joel kind of mentioned it earlier. Yeah, I think he was. Were you talking about live fire though? Either live or dry, either way. I think that's the only way you can kind of work it down in there, and mm -hmm. then eventually it'll get used to two point nine, and then you go down to two point eight, and then your new comfort zone and what your normal would be two point nine, and then you work down from there. So, well, like as usual, honestly, we should make Juan shit go last because he already basically <laughs> answered the question that like directly. Hunter, you're right, uh, but what what? To kind of elaborate what Ponchik's saying is basically you you start cheating the rules and doing stuff that you don't think you're supposed to be able to do. Like this target was at seven yards and I barely saw a blur of my fiber and I shot and by golly, I hit an alpha. And then you kind of have those little moments and you learn I don't have to see like a crisp front sight through the rear notch, perfect alignment to shoot alphas at seven yards. And then through like what Kim's saying, confirmation drill and training, you learn you can kind of what paint outside the lines, so to speak, I suppose. Yes. That's a great way of putting paint that. outside the lines. Confirmation Fair drills available on PSG.us. <laughs> yes. yes. All right. But so the, you would go to the range and do confirmation drill and learn kind of the input is the aiming scheme and the outputs what the hits look like on the target. And then his dry fire would be about learning to apply the input. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, you guys are too smart. That's the problem. Anyway, I think this was a bang up podcast, especially that part in the middle about the dots. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah you said plenty. Yes. <laughs> All right. Close it so we can get to playing video games now. <laughs> Fuck you. All right. Uh, that's, that's, all, <laughs> that's all the podcast we have for you today, folks. Uh, if you have questions that you'd like answered, go to bensteger.com. Send me your question. Uh, you want to know about dots? You want to know how to design stages? You want Hopkins to shit on USPSA, whatever you want, send it to us. Uh, we'll make it happen. 